Welcome to the Proceedings Podcast. I'm Bill Hamlet, the Editor-in-Chief of Proceedings at the U.S. Naval Institute. Today is Friday, June 2nd, 2023. Good to have you on board, everybody. Today's show is brought to you by the members of the Naval Institute since 1873, 150 years this year. The members of the Naval Institute have been the foundation of everything we do, from proceedings to naval history to USNI news to professional books and events and conferences. If you enjoy the show, ring the bell, subscribe, recommend us to your friends, and become a member of the Naval Institute at usni.org slash join. All right, today we're going to talk about the June issue of Proceedings, which is just out. It's got a very cool cover. We're going to talk about the story of uh, how, to, how we created the cover. And uh, joining me today are my co-host, my deputy, Bill Bray, retired Navy captain, and Brian O'Rourke, the senior editor for Proceedings. And Brian, let's start with the cover, because uh, uh, tell the story of, of it and then how we, how we created or how we got an AI tool to create it. Sure. Uh, first, I want to say I'm going to pit- petition you to change my title to mature editor. Senior carries some implications I don't like. So, um, <laughs> so this issue, um, one, of the, uh, one of the board members, editorial board members, suggested at our last meeting as we were talking about this being the uh, IW issue, he said, well, of course, this is the issue you should use AI for. And uh, I think he was a little bit joking, but I think he was pre- actually serious about it. And there was sort of some uh, joking around the room, but I pulled up an AI tool I'd been playing with and created a couple of really terrible cover ideas, but I did it in about 90 seconds. And then everybody sort of took notice. A couple other board members who played with some tools started sharing theirs. And pretty soon we had a good idea that maybe this is what we should do. Uh, so the tool I used is called Mid Journey. I've tried a couple others, and most of them really get lost when it comes to military and naval things. They just don't have the what's called an AI training, right? They haven't been given a data set that some person has marked up that says, this is a destroyer, this is a cruiser, this is a frigate. Uh, after some exper- experimentation, I discovered that Mid Journey did know what the USS Arleigh Burke worked like, looked like. So I worked with that for a while. And if you look at the need to know section inside, you'll see a couple of examples of need to know, uh, uh, there we go, of the Burke class in the middle upper level there. Those are kind of interesting because one of the, they look very, very similar. I did some variations on things, uh, but one of them has replaced a satellite dish above the bridge with a giant clock. And our CEO, Vice Admiral Pete Daly, recognized right away that somewhere in mid-journey is hidden a picture of some pre-World War II battleships that had giant clocks right up there at the top. Uh, it was... It was a lot of work. Uh, it sounds like, oh, we had AI make the cover and you know we were good to go in a couple hours. And I'm not sure how many hours I spent on it. Part of it was trying a lot of different ideas and variations. As you could see on the previous page, I looked for some ship things. I tried, uh, there's one picture in there that's quite pretty actually. It, uh, it's supposed to be in the style of Claude Monet. It doesn't really look like Claude Monet. There it is in the upper right-hand corner of the sky, and colors are a little bit that, but it has nothing of the impressionistic look to it. In the bottom right, just for funsies, I did Van Gogh. Um, and you'll note a Coast Guard cutter there because I didn't want to forget our Coast Guard members, and you'll note that Mid Journey, as the, the caption reads, does not know a lot about Coast Guard cutters. Uh, when you look <laughs> When you look closely at it on uh, on the page, you'll realize it's put a giant like 32 pounder cannon on the front <laughs> where a um, where a five inch gun might go on a destroyer. So uh, yeah. it has an SM2 or SM6 launching uh, as yeah, well. Yeah, it's you know, and the whole bow is orange. I mean, right. you know, at least it says I kind of know what I'm looking for here, but it, it has a long way to go before it's doing what people fear. On the other hand, that long way to go is not nearly as far off as I would have bet when I started this this process. Um, We've also used, I've also used AI in the editing process. Uh, I discovered that I hate formatting footnotes. And if I put footnotes into ChatGPT and tell it to spit it out in Chicago Manual of Style format, it will. Yesterday, I thought I'd found a really great workaround for the authors who just give us hyperlinks. 
I put those in and it spit out full things. But when I noticed that it attributed a defense news article to USNI news editor in chief Sam Legrone, I realized there was something wrong. And I went through them and realized even when it was given a source, it was making up the source, which is something people have said happens when you ask it to write a term paper or whatever. So these things aren't quite there yet, but they are absolutely something we should be paying attention to. Um, I do want to say that cover, in addition to the work I spent generating it, our design team spent a lot of time with it once it was designed. Karen Eskew in particular spent a couple hours. We had one background we liked better. We had one plane we liked better. And to merge those images and then clean it up and make it look like a unified image was a lot of effort. So this was not a O-type F-35C into mid-journey and get a cool idea out. Um, yeah, so a lot of experimentation. Yeah. There's a cre I mean, I don't know how many I showed you. I probably showed you a hundred examples before right. we said, um, this one was relatively early and we just kept coming back to it. So we finally stuck with it, but it was a good learning process. There's a long way to go, but I wish it were, I wish it were longer in some ways. Yeah. Another thought, uh, just wanted to throw this out. You know, we, we have, uh, most of the content that comes to proceedings is is written by people who submit to our essay contests or just submit an article to us. And, you know, for a few years now, we've been vigilantly using a plagiarism checker just to make sure that, you know, people aren't plagiarizing from uh, other people's work. And now we are also using an AI checker because we don't want people to say, hey, write a uh, you know, a Marine Corps essay in the preceding style for, you know, 2,500 words and that, that, you know, a chat GPT written article or essay winning one of our essay contests, that would be, that would be cheating. It would also be very bad reputationally for us. And so we're using AI checkers and we're, we're, as readers, we're paying special attention to like, does this seem like it was written by, you know, right, right now I'm reading the, um, the enlisted prize essay contest and, there's some stuff that we've seen where we go, I'm not so sure a sailor wrote this. You know, it's just a little bit, I don't know, too perfect or too anodyne, right. too vanilla in some places. And so that, you know, we've had a couple of not full essays, but chunks of them that the AI checker goes, this was maybe written by an AI. Right. And so then you go, Oh, okay. Um, it, 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 it is an, another layer of the, editing process where we have to do the due diligence to make sure that, you know, we're, we're not proceedings isn't written by chatbots, you know, <laughs> five years from now. When we were all kids, uh, the big thing was copying from the world book encyclopedia, right? right? Somebody in the neighborhood had that encyclopedia set. And it's amazing how dumb we were to think that the fifth grade teacher wasn't going to read this thing and say, this was clearly written by a college student or a PhD and you are clearly a fifth grader who couldn't write yesterday. Right. So, uh, I mean, it was, that's kind of, it's not that different with the AI checkers right now though. It's, they tend to regress to the mean and the easiest way to catch them right now is sources because I, I was talking to a friend who works at NASA and he was reading a paper that was submitted for peer review. And he looked at it and said, hey, this paper is written by the guy down the hall. I didn't know he wrote this. Let me go talk to him. and discovered, boom, that no such paper exists. The guy had written on that topic and he had written for that journal, but he didn't write any paper like that and, there, and no one else had either and they did, it didn't get confused. So it's yeah. not easy to catch, but it isn't hard to catch. And that's, that's the key. Uh, before we go to the first feature article, I, I want to chat about, I, I do want to mention that um, we are proud and happy to have with us our first group of summer interns uh, so every year now for the past, um, might be six years, this might be our sixth year minus a COVID year or two where we weren't able to do summer interns. We've had uh, Naval Academy and some NROTC um, midshipmen join us for a four-week block during the summer. We have three four-week blocks in the summer. Um, it's always great to have them. Right now we have four summer interns. We've got three from the University of Maryland and Baltimore County NROTC unit. And we've got one from the Naval Academy and they're actually monitoring the show right now. Uh, so that's kind of fun, but it's great to have them on board. And it's just a, uh, it's a terrific, I, I want to say a reality check for a guy who's getting close to 60 and graduated from the Naval Academy more than 30 years ago to have young midshipmen with us for the summer 
and bounce ideas off of them and to iterate with them and to get their insights and thoughts about how we can do better uh, keeping our content and keeping our products relevant to young readers. So it's great to have the mids on board. Um, the first uh, article I wanted to chat about was one, uh, it's the Naval Postgraduate School Essay Contest winner. It's titled Fleet Tactics and Special Warfare by Lieutenant Commander Kenneth Walls. He's a, a SEAL officer uh, out at MPS right now getting a master's degree. And um, I love this because it's the first time I'd ever heard a SEAL mention Wayne Hughes's fleet tactics. And, um, and so Commander Walls, you know, looking at, and, and this is a, we know from having uh, uh, Admiral Howard write for the, the Commander of Naval Special Warfare Command write for April issue last year, that SEALs are getting back to their naval roots. They're thinking about naval warfare. They're thinking about being an extension of uh, the fleet combat capability. They're thinking about missile warfare. And, and in, this, in this case, uh, Commander Walls is very much thinking about missile warfare. Obviously, the SEALs are not going to be firing anti-ship uh, cruise missiles, but how do they participate in the find, fix, you know, track um, and, and BDA effort in that? Um, you know, it's it's littoral warfare um, and, and how, how are SEALs in their special capabilities and their sensor capabilities uh, going to be part of that? It's a it's a terrific article. I'm not doing it justice in 30 seconds, but I, I highly recommend it. It was it was the clear winner uh, in the 30 or so um, essays we got from the Naval Postgraduate School. Uh, in this year's contest. It's, it's terrific. I look forward to being out at NPS at the end of next month, the end of July. I'll be out there and uh, we'll do a, a, a photo op and a grip and grin and um, I'll get to meet Commander Walls and that, that's always a good thing to do. Bill, what was on uh, your, your list of a couple of articles you wanted to highlight today? Yeah, sure. So the first one is uh, by Lieutenant Commander Tyson Meadors. Uh, I uh, full disclosure, I've known Tyson since he was an ensign as an intelligence officer. He is now a cyber warfare engineer, which is a small uh, community um, uh, under 100 officers, I believe, um, <clears throat> who essentially develop um, cyber warfare tools. Tyson's also on an editorial board as the IW rep, um, uh, about to go off, but he, he's been with us for a bit now. And he's a super, super smart guy on cyber, um, one of the smartest guys on active duty, probably, um, on the cyber problem. So this article is, is a great read for the uh, all naval officers, but particularly uh, URL officers that will be commanding units um, in the fleet. Um, what uh, Tyson does here is he, he walks you through... Um, kind of the industry standard, he references CrowdStrike, the, the uh, cyber defense uh, uh, company, um, a lot in this, but how they, how they determine what is good in the, in the world of cyber defense, meaning how long does it take you to detect somebody's in your network, um, how long does it take you to cleanse the network, and in all that, everything from detection to, you know, getting the thing back online, but he also... Uh, correlates that or uh, aligns that with operational realities. Like if you have to do something in 48 hours operationally in the Western Pacific, you know, you need to understand the, what, what happens when, when a uh, network is compromised uh, on the ship and the, in the squadron, whatever the case may be. We, I talk to myself or a lot of people that aren't in the cyber business, Something happens on a network, there's malware, there's whatever. We just sit there and go, okay, someone's got to clean this up. And I don't know, I have any idea how long this takes, uh, you know, how it's done. Just, you know, call me when it's ready kind of thing. And um, it's, it's a great article, for I think, for people. It's written in plain English. It's not super techie. Um, and it, it, it walks, walks commanders through, okay, this is, this is the reality of, of what happens. So I really commend that. Um, I put it on my own LinkedIn page. It's got 7,000 plus views in 18 hours. And so it's, it's uh, a lot of people, I think, um, you know, uh, appreciated that, uh, that approach. Yeah, the, the, the phrases or the uh, 
um, the terms he describes and, and defines breakout time, mean time to detect, mean time to patch, mean time to contain, and mean time to recover. And uh, that, as you pointed out, he, he takes the tech speak and dumbs it down for the, the lay reader, the operational user, the, the CEO, the OPSO of a DDG or a carrier, like, okay, what's this gonna mean? And how's, how long is it gonna take to fix before my weapon system or my network or my comm system is back up and I can you know, rely on it and depend on it? Great piece. Um, Brian, what, what else was on your list? So I worked with uh, Lieutenant Commander Greg Porter on Run Silent, Not Deep, which is like a lot of the best ideas, a very simple, straightforward idea. Submarines routinely operate with limited to no communication with the outside world. And they go to great lengths to avoid having any detectable emissions, including acoustic emissions. They, despite the fact that in most movies about submarines, you sort of hear a constant sonar ping sound in the background of everything, they never use their active sonars unless they have to. Uh, and usually by that point, the game has been given up. They're, everybody's aware where everybody else is roughly. There's no more secrecy, so you can, you can do that. That's his point. Surface ships need to learn to do the same thing. They need to learn to operate without electronic emissions, without radar. They need passive systems, much as submarines have hydrophones. The surface ships need to operate under commander's intent more, not constantly seeking guidance from higher up the chain. Uh, they need to be in receive only mode and not even that all the time. They're gonna have very bandwidth, low probability of detection items. Uh, Lieutenant Commander Porter is an information warfare officer, not a submariner, not a surface warfare person. So he's, he emphasizes electronic warfare as something that provides alternatives, that gives passive systems and also provides some active emission punch when necessary. It's a very good article. It's very, As with Tyson's article, it's very straightforward linguistically. It doesn't doesn't get down in the weeds of what electronic warfare systems can do in a technical sense. It doesn't get lost in the jargon, but it basically proposes a straightforward idea and explains it pretty well and makes a very good case for it. And I hope our surface warfare readers will pay attention to this one. Uh, we, we've had a lot on this conceptually on this in terms of how to fight when the network dies was an article a couple of years ago and fighting in the dark and all that sort of thing. His point is don't wait for that to happen. Fight that way from the outset as much as possible. And that's an idea worthy of discussion in just the way the forum discusses. Yeah, practice it now. And uh, you know, it, it, it's a bit, there's a bit of, uh, if I remember correctly, he harkens back to uh, Cold War electro, you know, we, you know, electromagnetic emissions control. We did MCON a, a lot in the Cold War, you know, because we were very cognizant of what the, what the Soviets could do, where their sensors were, and when their satellites passed overhead, and you know, and so there was just an awful lot of MCON, and not it's not. I think he said in this article, or maybe it was another article, that it's not. It's not an on-off switch. There's a there's a rheostat, right? Uh, and you've got to think about there are times when you uh, can take a little bit of risk and you can you know use some of your systems, but maybe not all of them. And then there's times when you know you really want to go dark as a submariner does, um, and and not make it easy at, at all for the adversary to find you. But it, yeah, it's right. a great point. He and, thinks he thinks the Navy is a little too focused on hard to find in the physical sense. If you look at some of the, if you look at the um, LCS hull form or the uh, the Zumwalt hull form, those are meant to prevent IR and radar detection. But he wants, he thinks electronic detection is the bigger risk and wants to make ships hard to find in that way. Sorry, Bill Bray, I cut you off. No, no sorry. The, the, the professional note by Warren Officer LeBrenz, um, Drill MCON, complements this uh, essay pretty well. So Lebrenz's point is MCON is a skill that you need to drill. You need to practice 
you know, routinely, just like he compares it to gunnery of, of the days of old, you know, to, to make uh, gunnery teams efficient and, and uh, expert at what they do, they have to keep doing it and they have to. Um, so we, Bill's right. I mean, we did get away from this for a long time. I don't really, I'm not sure. I haven't been in the fleet in a while, you know, what they're doing now, but it's, uh, it's pretty complicated. And, um, and you really have to think through, you know, what are the pros and cons of keeping this on or turning this off? I, I remember, um, this is again, late cold war when we were doing, uh, MCON stuff on aircraft carriers. Uh, at times, you would have a, a, a PRIC 117, which was the aviator's uh, emergency rescue um, radio, essentially. So if somebody had to eject, um, it's how they communicate with, you know, back home and, and you know, coordinate this, the uh, search and rescue effort. Um, and one of those would go off. A beacon would go off or the radio would be turned on somehow accidentally. And the whole MCON drill would, like, come to a screeching halt. It'd be like, all right. Who's, who's prick 117 is going off. It would, you know, that that's the extent to which you, you pay attention. It's not just the big rotating radars, but it's also the little tiny things that can give you away. Yeah. It's a, it's a great point. Uh, I wanted to highlight uh, another information warfare essay, which uh, to me was really eye opening. It's by major Sharon Rollins uh, titled defensive cyber warfare lessons from inside Ukraine. So, you know, the, the, the fight is ongoing. One of the things early in the, you know, in the, in the conflict when the Russians invaded, a lot of people projected that the Russians would be able to completely sort of electromagnetically, um, you know, kill the Ukrainians, uh, you know, shut down their power grids, shut down their information warfare systems, shut down their networks and their internet and all those things. Uh, and they they haven't been able to. And, and this article tells you at least some of why. So there was, a, and, and Major Rollins was part of a hunt forward team that deployed to Ukraine before the war. You know, they came out uh, just before, but in the fall of 2021, a, uh, a, a U.S. Cyber Command hunt forward team went to Ukraine, worked side by side with them and helped them harden their networks and help them realize where they were vulnerable and the types of attacks that, that might come if the Russians invaded. Uh, and this is part of why the Ukrainians have had a very, um, you know, robust uh, command and control. I mean, the, the fact that Zelensky has been on national and international TV every night is something that I predicted probably would come to an end very quickly and has not. So uh, it, it's, I know that Major Rollins had to go through because she's at Cybercom, NSA, et cetera. There was a big effort to get this article cleared through the release procedures, right? So there's a lot of this that, you know, some people a couple of years ago might've said, you know, we can't even talk about that. Um, but it's talked about, it's in the pages of proceedings. We have hunt forward teams at the sort of cyber national mission uh, level and they can do this. This is a capability that they bring to allies and partners, to U.S. forces forward deployed. It's a very cool story. And, uh, you know, it's uh, we haven't had a lot of stuff on lessons learned from Ukraine, but this is a, a particularly terrific one and especially pertinent to this issue, the, the IW issue. Bill, what was your next one you wanted to talk about? Yeah, uh, my next one is uh, the winner of the 2020, uh, 20, 2022, sorry, uh, information were published in 23, uh, information warfare essay contest. It's by uh, Lieutenant Commander Adam Reifen. He is a intelligence officer out in uh, San Diego doing his 04 CBD on a CSG staff. Uh, the you can see the title there, Navy Information Warfare Needs Requirements Officers. So a requirements officer now is, is more of a formal thing in the Navy. And this was established by uh, Chief of Naval Operations, uh, Admiral John Richardson. Um, there have been officers doing requirements work for years, decades. Um, the Navy, of course, like all the services, have a Title X responsibility to equip, to buy things and uh, equip the force. Um, and in the, uh, in the Navy's case, uh, the, the, the big, big uh, warfare 
uh, Baron areas are in the on the OPNAV staff, aviation, submarine uh, warfare, and surface warfare, and to some degree uh, amphibious warfare uh, and uh, naval special warfare. But <clears throat> what what happens here is at the front end of an acquisition cycle, you have to tell the bidders that that, that bid on uh, bid on contracts. You got to tell them what you need. Right, this thing needs to do X, Y, and Z. Um, so again, URLs have been doing this for ages. Um, uh, now, more recently, you, you can actually get an AQD, an additional qualification designator uh, for, as an officer, as a requirements officer, it requires some training and some experience, et cetera. Um, the, the information work for a community, according to Commander Rifen, is uh, behind the curve on this. They, they didn't really uh, adopt this and they, because of that, the uh, information warfare community, which is uh, headed it, it, it on the OpNav staff by uh, CNO and two and six, um, it kind of relegates or uh, allows the, the 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 URL community to define the requirements, and they don't do it. What am I talking about? So if the aviation community um, is you know looking for a new UAV that is um, going to uh, do many things, but um, one of those things would be intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance, which is an IW mission. Um, they are defining most of the requirements for the contractors to bid, and the IW is not in there as much. That's my interpretation of Adam's uh, article. Um, so the, play, the the UAV needs to be, you know, able to fly this high, this far, or do, do, do aviation stuff, but it also, the package, the thing that has to go on it um, is an IW mission, and then you can't just assume that you can put any package on this thing. It's got weight. It's got other. It's got, it's competing for space for other things. So it's a it's a collaborative effort. And um, Adam's uh, main point is that the IW community needs more formal requirements officers. The requirements officer jobs and the N two N six staff should be seen as key jobs, key shore duty jobs um, that are briefed and and highlighted for promotion boards. Um, so it's a pretty good article um, and very interesting take on that. Agreed. Uh, Brian, what was your next article? So I, I don't often, I'm not sure I have highlighted this. Uh, Naval Systems has been written for 25 years by Ed Walsh, a longtime contributor to the Institute. Um, he was the editor of Naval Systems Update at one point. Ed uh, brought a really interesting piece this month. Sometimes it's kind of down in the weeds and interesting, but here's how many modules Raytheon is building for the SPY-6 V1 radar, you know, that kind of thing. Uh, this, he sort of takes a bigger look and he looks at a ship that doesn't get a lot of attention, although coincidentally, we've paid it a, more, than a, more attention in the past few months than I think we ever have in my time at the Institute, the Expeditionary Fast Transport. And as the headline Expeditionary Autonomous Transports implies, he's looking at the Navy's plan to make some of these autonomous or semi-autonomous and reduce the already low manning of these to nearly nothing, or in fact, nothing in some cases. Uh, EPF is an interesting thing to me because it, it sort of started as a redheaded stepchild. It was a joint army Navy program. It was the high speed vessel and then it was the joint high speed vessel. And then the army got out of it and gave the whole thing over to the Navy. And not too long after it became the expeditionary fast transport. Nobody was paying a lot of attention to it. It was just kind of quietly doing its thing. And all of a sudden, if you read the article, you'll see the Navy is thinking of all sorts of ways to use this. It's sort of the anti-LCS in that it quietly happened, that it, it, didn't, it wasn't hyped, it didn't get a lot of attention, and it's a pretty good vessel. And so it, when I was at Sea Air Space, um, we saw, a few months ago, we saw mar models of these painted white with red crosses on them. And we've had articles advocating for use of, as I guess I wouldn't call them hospital ships exactly. It's more like a floating emergency room. And it can't take enormous amounts of uh, casualties on board, but it can do, you can do sophisticated surgery on them because the catamaran hull gives it a stability that the mono hull doesn't get. 
So Ed does a little bit more of a deep dive into a ship here than we usually get, and he did a, he did, <laughs> he did a really nice job at it. And uh, you'll definitely learn something about a ship you probably don't know too much about if you take a look at those. Yeah, agreed. And I, I think the uh, Marine Corps is experimenting, you know, to your point that is, it's a bit of a Swiss Army knife. The Marine Corps is using the EPFs at, at, in, in the interim as sort of an experimental uh, platform to develop some of its EABO, FD2030 kinds of concepts and capabilities as, a, as an interim before they get the landing ship medium, the LSM. Right. Yeah, which is another interesting aspect. And Pete Pagano, a month or two ago, Captain Pete Pagano highlighted the EPF as that should be the LSM. We should just build these as the LSM uh, right. you know, uh, uh, hull form. Probably the best thing that's ever happened to this program is nobody ever said, can we put a VLS on it? Because that allowed it to stay what it is. And now you can Swiss Army knife it into adjacent purposes rather than trying to make it, you know, one more source of those. I'm sure somebody somewhere is looking at that, but it's a mature enough thing now. That's a good thing to do. It's not, it's not the Pentagon Wars. Hey, let's play with this Bradley fighting vehicle in so many different ways. And it can't have a cannon, but it should have a bigger cannon. Right. They, they, they just built these and are testing them and, and they're starting to use them for real. So yeah. bravo. Right. Easy. Right. Giant, you know, big helo deck, right? Uh, right? And also, you know, I would imagine that there's uh, space and weight um, reservation to allow at least a box or two of naval strike missiles if you wanted to go that way. Yeah, and you could put a company of Marines on there or something close to a company-sized element. It'll land a V-22. It'll land a Seahawk. Uh, it's just a friend of mine who is an intelligence junior officer spent a, a cruise in the med using these and was really experimenting with UAVs from them and trying to innovate and succeeding and failing as innovators do, but learning a lot in the process. Uh, and as the high speed name and the original joint high speed vessel title implies, this thing has some kick. It, it officially can do 35 knots and we know Navy doesn't like to tell us what the actual top speed of anything is. So it's probably got a sprint speed even higher than that. Yep. Yep. Uh, last one I wanted to highlight was uh, the winner of the Mind Warfare Essay Contest by Lieutenant Junior Grade A.J. Douglas. And it's titled Get Serious About Countering China's Mind Warfare Advantage. Uh, this points out that the Chinese have... Um, Historically, the PLA Navy has taken mine warfare very seriously. Uh, it's a key part of uh, sabotage warfare at sea within Chinese doctrine. Um, it's also considered a, an assassin's mace capability or a weapon system that gives an inferior military an advantage against a more advanced one. And so AJ's uh, point here is, hey, the Chinese have got at least 50 possibly 100,000 naval mines. And these are a critical part of its anti-access area denial, counter-intervention strategy. And in a Taiwan scenario, if the United States and other allies are going to come to the rescue of Taiwan or defend Taiwan, um, mine warfare is going to be a significant part of the challenge. And he also goes on to point out you know, how many mine uh, countermeasure ships we have, the Avenger class, uh, it's eight remaining and they are fast being decommissioned. Um, the littoral combat ship fleet is not, uh, has not produced what the, you know, the Navy hoped it would. And one of those options for the LCS was gonna be this mine warfare module uh, that hasn't really come to fruition in, in large numbers yet. The Navy has these expeditionary mine countermeasures capabilities, which is more, um, you know, think uh, EOD techs with um, uh, UUVs that they can, you know, kind of hand put into the water off of, um, you know, a, a, a rigid hull inflatable boat or another platform. But our mine warfare capabilities aren't up to the task, is his point. You, you know, numerically, maybe qualitatively, but numerically, when you're if you're talking uh, 50 or 100,000 naval mines, 
uh, like, oh my God, we, we need to get serious about this problem very quickly. And he, he, he makes some recommendations for, you know, swinging some of those uh, Avenger class uh, minesweepers that are currently in the Persian Gulf in Fifth Fleet, moving them to the Indo-PACOM, uh, upping the amount of, uh, and, you know, rapidly deploying some of these ex-mine countermeasures, uh, putting some of them on fleet tugs, right? So, you know, put a mine uh, mine countermeasures package on a on a fleet tug, or almost any almost any surface platform. Might maybe even the EPF. I don't think he says that, but I'm throwing that out because we were just talking about the EPF. But we the the U.S. Navy and our allies and partners are going to have to have a much bigger mine countermeasures capability than we currently do, and that, that's his takeaway. It's a real, very well written. I command again that the, the uh, author is Lieutenant Junior Grade. Go, go, JOs, uh, AJ Douglas, and uh, this is the winner of the of the mine warfare contest. And I, I also want to thank the uh, uh, the mine warfare mine warfare foundation that helps us and sponsors this and and helps um, pick the winners of this contest uh, every year as well. Expeditionary EOD isn't going to clear a hundred thousand mines, you know. To, to paraphrase B.J. Armstrong, small man, it's Iron Men. Rubber boats is not going to get the job done there. So uh, yeah, the Navy has to figure this one out because it's it's what's the old saying? Uh, every ship can be a minesweeper once. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. and the uh, you know the, the the Cold War adage uh, uh, of um, you know quantity has a quality all its own, and some might say, well, you know, we we can sweep these Chinese mines. Okay. Yeah, on an individual basis, tens or twenties of them, maybe sure, um, but uh, you know, thousands of them. That's a that's a very different scope of problem. And as we saw in in Desert Storm, and uh, Lieutenant Douglas uses that example as most most mine warfare um, articles do bring up Desert Storm, and they bring up the Princeton, and they bring up the Tripoli, and they bring up the Roberts, and they. You know, they talk about, hey, small numbers of mines. In, in the case of Desert Storm, it was about a thousand Iraqi mines, um, you know, that, that, that took out a, a couple of U.S. Navy frontline warships and, and just took them out of the fight. So it, it's a significant problem. And the Navy has a tendency to forget or to, di you know, uh, diminish the threat in its thinking and its planning and its progr programming and budgeting and to its to its potential detriment. Mines are like roaches. When you see one, there's probably more there. And even if you see one and there aren't more there, you have to assume there are. That's that's a great analogy. <laughs> yeah. All right. Any uh, parting, parting shots, saved rounds? Uh, I was going to mention one more article, if that's all right. I don't know. Yeah, please. So the winner of the diversity and inclusion essay contest. Um, and I know this is somewhat of a hot button issue for some people. And I get it. But um, I think this is a good article for, for you know, one, really one main reason. So there's, there is a chorus of folks that believe that diversity and inclusion is a, uh, it, it doesn't, it doesn't improve war fighting. You know, it has nothing to do with war fighting. Okay. So these two authors, Ensign's Nicholas uh, Romanow and Madison Sargent, uh, Nick is a uh, cryptologic warfare officer, uh, graduate from the University of Texas. Uh, ROTC and Madison went to Boston University, delayed her commissioning for a year, and went and got a master's in Russian studies at Columbia. She is a SWO. Um, and they took that question, you know, does, does inclusion matter, um, and turned it kind of on its head and said, we're going to show you two countries, principal adversaries of the United States, Russia and China, and how they do not uh, include uh, their ethnic minorities very well in their militaries. Um, they, they mistreat them. They're second-class citizens at best. And this leads to all sorts of war fighting problems, particularly trust, um, morale. Uh, people in, uh, you know, ethnic minorities in Russia are wondering, why am I dying for? I'm not even treated well um, anyway in, in, in China. Uh, if you're not Han Chinese, you know, good luck, uh, you know, advancing far in their military um so i think it's that's an important point you know we tend to like try to falsify something that we can't really prove and uh instead of looking at countries that don't do this well 
you can make an argument the United States does it well enough and, and it, we, we have no more miles to run. I guess you can make that argument. But, you know, I, I, it reminds me of, you know, some time I spent in East Africa, particularly Ethiopia and Kenya, and I was pretty shocked. Maybe I shouldn't have been um, because I didn't know the region well until I got there. Um, how poorly minorities in those countries are treated. I mean, particularly Ethiopian army is, is being used against ethnic minorities in the Somali region, in the Aroma region, uh, Kenyans, you know, um, same thing. So uh, it's, it, it is a factor, it is a war fighting factor, it's an important factor for society in general, but you know, particularly for war fighting, you, you go to war as a society, not just as a military. And um, and people need to feel enfranchised and that they, 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 they're fully buying into the project. And that is not happening in Russia and China. And I think right now in, in, with the Russia-Ukraine, you can see that somewhat playing out. Anyway, that's all I have on that. No, that's a good point. And, and I would just you know add to that. This reminded me uh, back in 2004 when I had arrived in, in Russia as a naval attache uh, in that first fall. It was September, October timeframe. Uh, and a big news story uh, was that five Chinese, so a lot of people, you know, with China, Russia, they're allies and partners. And yes, but uh, I always have in mind this point, right? Five Chinese naval officers who were assigned to the Russian Naval War College in St. Petersburg. So these were commanders and captains in, in, the, in the PLA Navy going to the Russian War College uh, on their way home one day from class back to where they lived. They're walking as a group in uniform and a group of Russian skinheads attacked them and beat them to hell. Uh, two of them ended up hospitalized. One, I, if I remember right, one lost the sight in one of his eyes. It was horrific. Uh, and I called, I actually called my Chinese counterpart at the time because we all were in this, you know, foreign attache association. But I called my Chinese counterpart. I said, hey, I am so sorry to hear what happened to your colleagues up in St. Petersburg. It was horrific, but it was it was to the point that Sergeant, uh, that the, these two ensigns make, right? That the Russians don't do well with racial diversity. They don't do well with, you know, if you're not a white Russian, you know, uh, you're not gonna do well in the Russian military. You'll be a conscript, you'll be treated like a conscript. Um, and they, the, the idea that the Russians and the Chinese have a natural bonding partnership is something that I look at uh, with, with a, 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 you know, a skeptical eye at the, at the very least. Yep. OK, well, this was a great conversation, as always. The June issue, information warfare, uh, information warfare issue uh, with the AI generated cover. Uh, it's a terrific issue, cover to cover, lots and lots of great content. Uh, if it hasn't hit your um, your mailbox yet, you can find it usni.org forward slash uh, proceedings. Um, and uh, I encourage you to, to read it, share it with your friends. And, uh, uh, and then we look forward to the July issue, which is naval aviation. And we're working on that one right now. And we'll be bringing the naval aviation issue to the Tailhook Symposium in Reno, Nevada, towards the end of August. And look forward to that being there in person again and uh, being with uh, all my aviator buddies. And I think Ward will be there too with his own, his own booth, of course, and probably, a, you know, he'll have roadies with him and all that kind of stuff. But, uh, <laughs> all right, well, this- I was, I was flipping around on one of my streaming channels last night and I realized you can have your Top Gun Maverick. The final countdown is the greatest movie about naval aviation in history and I wound up watching it. So Kirk Douglas is just fantastic. That is a great one. <laughs> All right. Well, we're out of time. This episode is brought to you by the members of the Naval Institute. Since 1873, our members have fostered the free and open debate that has moved the sea services forward. To become a member, go to usni.org forward slash join. And until next week, remember, victory begins at the Naval Institute.